All right, good evening, everybody. We are going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, looking at verses 9 through 15. We got tonight, and one more study, and then we'll be completing 2 Timothy and diving right into the book of Titus. But tonight, as we're closing Paul's thoughts and really closing this letter, which um, is the, the last letter he wrote, the last message we have from Paul, uh, we're going to be talking about Christian friendship and what that looks like, what a good Christian friend is, uh, what one isn't, and really how to be in a place of ministry or to be available for a place of ministry to our friends as believers. And so um, Paul the Apostle, he understood the importance of friends. He especially understood the importance of friends during difficult times. Years earlier in Paul's ministry in Macedonia, he was so exhausted by conflicts, by inner fears, and really by the relentless fact that he had no rest for his body, he said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. He said, in fact, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. Instead, we were troubled in every way. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the arrival of Titus. Now that word downcast that he said there actually is also translated depressed. That God comforts the depressed. And he was comforted by the arrival of his friend. Times were very, very tough for Paul and discouragement was incredible at that particular time in his life. But it wasn't things that brought comfort to Paul. That's the point. It wasn't, you know, uh, if I get a new car, I'll feel better. If I get a new house, I'll feel better. If I get a new job, I'll feel better. If I get some new friends, I'll feel better. Sure, there's times in our life where new friends will definitely help, but um, this wasn't Paul's situation. Um, it was the loving encouragement of his friend Titus that showed up. And the effect of this encouragement on Paul at this particular time in his life was priceless because in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul went on to say he was comforted by the arrival of Titus, but not only by his arrival, but also by the comfort he received from you. He told us about your deep longing, your sorry, sorrow, and your zeal for me so that I rejoiced even more. So Paul was lifted up by a friend coming to him and not only being there personally to minister to him, to bring encouragement to him, but also then to bring the message that, hey, others are praying for you and others are, are thinking about you and others are lifting you up as well. And it really was uh, an example, Titus example to ministry that, that God's people need today. And so here in 2 Timothy, as we get to the end of this letter, Paul had already praised Titus and, and the Titus like ministry that others had done uh, in the name of a man named Onesiphorus. In chapter 1, verses 6 through 18, we learned a few things about Paul's arrest and what happened and about this man named Onesiphorus who came to minister him. And basically what it tells us there, you don't have to turn there, but, but uh, most of the believers in Asia, Paul says, had deserted him. The people that he had been teaching and training and leading and discipling, um, most of them, and specifically it was in the area where Ephesus was, which is where Timothy was ministering and this letter was being written to, um, had left him. Guys like Phy uh, Phygelus or Phygelus and Hermogenes. Um, but Onesiphorus, it tells us in chapter one of this letter, um, actually did the opposite, that when he found out that Paul had gotten arrested and Paul was now uh, in jail in Rome for the second time, it says that Onesiphorus traveled to Rome and, quote, diligently searched for and found Paul. That the picture of this friend who made the long journey from Ephesus all the way to Rome, then got to Rome and started knocking on doors. Hey, do you know where Paul's at? hey, I heard Paul got arrested. Do you know where he's at? Now, at this particular point in time, you have to understand that for Onesiphorus to do this was a big deal because the first time Paul got arrested, it was just house arrest, right? It was like, you did something bad, we're going to put you on house arrest. This time, Paul was put into what was essentially a military prison. This wasn't a, hey, you're on house arrest for a while and then you're going to be okay. It's like, no, no, we, we're putting you here because you're going to be executed. This is a military prison. He was there for high treason, and so for Onesiphorus to walk around and knock on doors, 
to say, hey, where's Paul? I'm, I'm, I'm here to encourage him. I'm here as his friend to bring him hope and encouragement and prayer and, and really put Onesiphorus at risk, asking for, hey, can you tell me where this uh, enemy of the state is being held? And so we find earlier in the letter that Paul says that when Onesiphorus found him, it says he often refreshed me, telling us that this friend of Paul's not only came one time and was like, hey, bro, I'm here to visit you in jail, and hey, how is it? Let me pray for you, and then left. No, no, he came back. He stayed in Rome for an extended period of time, continually coming back to Paul to encourage him. And so despite the danger, Onesiphorus returned again and again to minister to Paul in his dungeon. He was there for Paul in one of Paul's darkest moments. And so knowing that kind of background and then knowing from the beginning of this letter what's happened and how um, Onesiphorus has ministered to him, we see no evidence that Paul is depressed in this letter. No evidence at all. On the contrary, if you were with us last week in the preceding paragraph that we looked at that Paul just wrote, really what we saw is a man who gave a victorious declaration as he, as he looked out from the bars of his cell, if you will, and I quoted a poem that said, two men were behind the bars, and one looked, or they both looked out, one saw the mud, one saw the stars, right? Talking about perspectives. And so at this point in Paul's life, he wasn't depressed. He wasn't, you know, oh, woe is me, my life is over. He was in a very difficult situation. He knew he was going to die, but he still had this radical perspective of what was going on. It was still a tough time. It was probably one of the toughest times that Paul had ever gone through. And so Paul knew the importance that when you're going through really, really tough times, you really need some tough friends. And this is really the encouragement to us as believers tonight because we're going to not only find ourselves in tough times in our life, in our faith, many of us are going to find that those tough times are because of our faith. And it's in those really difficult times when the world stands against you when the world comes against you, when the world starts to um, trying to get you to lose your job or to lose your house or to lose your finances, to, to kick you when you're down, you really need tough friends in those tough times because those tough friends are the people that really are going to help you continue in your faith and have the proper perspective. And so the importance of Christian relationships to Christian continuance is kind of what this section is going to be about tonight. And so here at the end of his life, as Paul's closing his thoughts here, he became intensely directive as he's really calling the final shots, giving his final instructions that he needed to give to, to the, the men that served and worked with him from his death cell. So let's uh, go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into diving into it. Father, we thank you, God, so much for your word, and we thank you, God, for uh, all of it, God, all the encouragements, all the blessings, Lord. God, your word is so rich and so deep and so wide and so applicable to everything. God, everything from, from deep theology to real practical things about how to be a good friend. Lord, your word talks about everything from how to love in a way that is beyond us as humani uh, humanity and how to, how to have faith, God, how to not worry about things, Lord, how to be. And God, there is so much about our lives as Christians that if we just conducted ourselves the way you want us to, God, things would be so much better. If we treated each other the way you want us to, if we talked to each other the way you want us to, if we were... They're truly exercising and expressing godly love towards one another the way you want us to. Lord, things would just be so much better, God. And so encourage us tonight. Challenge us, God, to, to be like the people that Paul reached out to in his darkest times. Lord, that we would be encouraged to be like these men that Paul reached out to because he knew that they were dependable, that they were faithful. He had a relationship with them that transcended just mere surface formality, God, but it was a deep, intimate friendship that he had with these guys. And that, Lord, we would be encouraged to not only be those people in the lives of those we know when they're in difficult times, but God also to know and to pray for, and to raise up and be surrounded by people who are those tough friends for us in our tough times. So God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. It says, Make every effort to come to me soon, Paul says, because Demas has deserted me, since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. 
pretty dire after the preceding paragraph, right? The victory. I look at my present. I look at my past. I look at my future. It's awesome. And then he's like, Timothy, please come to me quickly. The first directive he's given here as he's closing this letter in his time of need is that I need my friends here with me. And think about it. He's writing this letter to Timothy who is running the church in Ephesus, right? There was already a previous letter as Timothy is trying to pastor the church in Ephesus and lead that fellowship and there's men there who are trying to undermine the ministry. And Paul wrote him a letter to say, hey, let me, let me help you out. Let me give you some advice. And now he's writing the second letter as some of those problems uh, didn't go away or got worse or changed. And so now at the end of this letter, after all of this stuff of Timothy, let me tell you, let me give you advice on how to fix things there in Ephesus. Oh, by the way, Timothy, drop everything in Ephesus and come immediately to Rome. Why would Paul say that? Why would he wrap up his letter on how to fix things where you're at with, oh, by the way, drop everything and come to me? Why would Paul say that? Well, there's a few reasons, I believe. One of them is if you know the relationship that Paul and Timothy had, they had this real deep father-son relationship. Um, Paul had referred to Timothy in, in numerous places as my beloved child. Um, in 2 Timothy 1.4, Paul said, Remembering your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. So there was a moment where, where, where Paul has a memory of Timothy's tear-filled filled love. As, as maybe Paul had to depart or whatever the situation was, but Timothy had tears in his eyes as, as Paul, his mentor, his father figure, was leaving. And Paul said, remembering that time, I long to see you, that it would fill me with joy. Timothy was the son that Paul never had. So they had this really deep, intense relationship as, as like a father and a son, a mentor uh, type of relationship. And so he says, come to me soon. This was a pretty big thing for Paul to ask for, the journey from Ephesus to Rome was a four to six month trip over land with some uh, ocean routes. You know, some of us, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too, right? We have our friends that live like five minutes away down the street and they're like, hey, can you come help me with something? And you're like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm busy. I'm tied up, right? Oh, it's a whole five minutes away, right? This was a four to six month trip. He's saying, come to me soon. The trip had inherent dangers, but it had to be made quickly. You know, I think Paul was counting on the, the, the slow pace of Roman justice um, to allow Timothy to, to get there before he was executed. You know? But Paul knew the end is coming. Come, come to me soon. <laughs> like, you know, I, 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 I'm hoping and praying that you can make it within four to six months, that I won't be executed within the next four to six months. Now, why would Paul ask Timothy to come when there were so many problems in Ephesus, as I was mentioning? Well, one, we talked about the depth of their relationship, but I believe that at the end of Paul's life, Paul had some important truths, some important strategies that he needed to impart to Timothy. You see, a lot of commentators consider the death of Paul was the conclusion of the first missionary period of the church. Really, Paul was, was the, the missionary general of the church at that time. He took the gospel all over the known world. He planted so many churches. He wrote most of the New Testament. And so with his death, it really was the end of the first generation of the growth of the church and that missionary work, so to speak. And so I believe Paul was like, hey, I got some instructions, some things I need to impart to you as you're going to continue the work after I'm God. The kind of stuff that, that really could only be communicated in a face-to-face -face conversation. And we've all been in those types of scenarios, right? You know, texting's just not going to cut it. A phone call's not going to cut it. An email's not going to cut it. And so you're like, hey, can we talk, right? Usually it's like you, you think something's bad. You know, hey, uh, can we talk? Yeah, what's up? Oh, we need to do it in person. <laughs> dun, 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 right? Bad news is coming. But no, this, it's not always bad news. It's just sometimes the gravity of the situation can't be conveyed with just words. There's body language. There's facial expression. There, there's an emotion that you need to convey because the, the information is so deep or so important. I believe that's what was going on here. And so, and then on top of that, if you look at verse 12, um, it tells us that Paul had already sent uh, Tychicus to Ephesus. So Paul's like, hey, Timothy, drop everything and come here. I've already sent Tychicus to, to, to cover the workload there in Ephesus. And so um, 
But we also have to understand, why would Paul say this to Timothy? Uh, we have to understand the depth of, of Paul's isolation at this time. You know, he was um, uh, in, a, in a very destitute situation. You know, he needed those tough friends for this tough time. Now look at the rest of, of verse 10 there. We see the depth of his is- isolation. He goes, come to me soon because Demas has deserted me since he loved this present world and has gone to Thessalonica. Now, to understand the gravity of how this affected Paul and why Paul was um, apparently so needy of Timothy, come soon, I need you here, um, on top of the other issues we just looked at, uh, was, was how this desertion by Demas affected Paul. Now, in order to understand that, we're going to look at Demas a little bit. What do we know about Demas? Well, according to Philemon, verse 24, um, we get the impression that Demas had a lot of potential. Demas was listed as a co-worker of Paul with Mark and Luke. Paul calls him one of my co-workers, or uh, your translation might say fellow worker. Um, being listed with Mark and Luke in, in Philemon there tells us that, that Demas was a part of Paul's inner circle, a part of his inner circle, right? His lieutenants, his go-to guys in the work of the ministry. Um, he had to have some significant spiritual substance to be counted as a co-worker by Paul. When Paul said someone was a co-worker to me, that, that carried a great amount of weight. That said, this is someone that is very important to me in the work of the ministry. Someone that I count on. Someone that I depend on. And you know, you could see Demas listed in different places throughout the New Testament. And you get the picture that, that he had been with Paul through many ups and downs. He had been with Paul through great ministerial victories. He had also been with, uh, with Paul through some of the down times. But apparently, this situation Paul had found himself in. This situation was too much for Demas. Like I said, Paul was not under house arrest like his first time here in Rome. He was in what was called the Mamertine Prison in Rome, which was, uh, the play, it was death row, is what it was. And uh, he was awaiting execution for treason. And so this situation, we don't know all the details of how Paul got arrested and all that, but whatever it was, it was too much for Demas. And so he packed his bags and he left to Thessalonica. Now, I do want to state that there's no suggestion here that Demas necessarily became a heretic or an apostate. There's no um, um, suggestion here that he left the Christian faith. Uh, Calvin actually commented on this and he said, we are not to suppose that he completely denied Christ and gave himself over again to ungodliness or the allurements of the world, but only that he cared more for his own convenience and safety than for the life of his friend Paul. He could not stay with Paul without involving himself in the many troubles and vexations and had a real risk to his own life. He was exposed to many reproaches. He was laid open to many insults. He was forced to give up caring for his own concerns. And in the circumstances, he was overcome by his dislike for the burden of the cross and decided to look after his own interests instead of those of his friend. Now, I personally believe that that Demas had no intention of quitting his Christianity, you know, because Paul says he left to Thessalonica. Thessalonica had a healthy vibrant, growing body of believers. There was a very healthy church there in Thessalonica. And so um, I, don't, I don't think this is telling that, that Demas was leaving Christianity. But it says that he left me since he loves the present world. And it doesn't make him a villain per se. What it does though is make him a man who fell into disgrace following a path that many people before him and after him have following. Demas, I don't believe, wanted to lose his Christianity, but at this particular moment in his life, it hurt too much to keep it. And so he bailed on Paul. So, since he loved the present world, what does this mean? What what does this tell us about about what Demas did? And this is really the picture of what not to do as a Christian friend, (laughs) okay? This is is what we're learning from this. Um, It says that he loved the present world. Being in love with the present world really is something that takes many different shapes uh, depending on, on who we are and where we are. It could be about comfort, uh, personal comforts, right? We want to keep our personal comforts rather than subject ourselves to discomfort for the faith. That could be loving the present world. It could be pursuing wealth um, in, at, at the expense of, of furthering the kingdom. It could be about pursuing our own fame, our own advantage. It could be a love of specific things over, the, over Christ and the spread of the gospel. Um, it could be any of those things. That really is anything that you put as a priority of your life over Jesus Christ. 
Anything you put in your life over Jesus Christ and the calling that he's laid on all of our lives to be a light and a witness of him in this world. So when we put anything this world has to offer above our relationship with Christ, we have then fallen into a place where we, were, where we are loving or falling in love with the present world. Maybe Demas never truly counted the cost of being a disciple of Christ. Maybe when he came to Christ, and even though he had done all this work with Paul, maybe he didn't fully understand the depth of the troubles he would face or the, the depth of the collision between the life he was living as a Christian and the world that he was living in. I personally believe that there's not a single Christian in the world today, myself included and every pastor I've ever met and ever will meet, that has not been swayed or tempted by the lure of comfort. We've all been tempted by that. It is way easier to not hand out the tract than it is to hand out the track. It is way easier to not have the spiritual conversation than it is to have the spiritual conversation. It is way easier to sleep in Sunday morning than it is to get up and go to church. And there's a million other things you could fill in the blank with. Our personal comforts are, are a great temptation to us, and I believe every Christian Every single Christian has been tempted by those things. Um, but the departure of Demas, it, it devastated Paul. It devastated Paul. And, and you could see that in the original Greek of the language there. It, it really something that, that hurt Paul deeply. I mean, this was a man that he had done ministry with for years. This was a man that, that on many levels, I'm sure Paul's like, I, I, I thought I knew him. But, he, but he, he bailed on me in the darkest need of my life. And really it shows us that your deepest hurts really can only come from the people you love the most, right? The people you love the most just have the power to hurt you the most. Your deepest disappointments can only come from the destruction of your deepest hopes. This is a very bitter pill for Paul. And the greatest disappointments and the greatest heart heartaches in my own ministry is the years that I've been preaching and, and working with people and kids and whatever it may be, the greatest disappointments and the greatest heartaches didn't come from my enemies. It didn't come from those who tried to make my life difficult because I was a Christian. It didn't come from those who hated the fact that I handed them a tract. It doesn't come from the people who have the really vile and hateful comments on YouTube from the Bible studies we post. The greatest disappointments and the greatest heartaches have come from those who started so well, right? Those that started growing in their faith and in, in, in a relationship of discipling and seeing them develop a hunger for the word and a passion for worship and want to get involved and minister to others. And you see such potential in them and you have such high hopes for them. But instead of growing, they instead become lovers of this world rather than lovers of Christ. They let the things of this world choke out their desire to pursue Christ with everything they have. Those are the greatest hurts and the greatest heartaches. So the mention of Demas here by Paul, I believe, as Paul is dictating this letter, reminded Paul of two other departures um, that, that incidentally appear to have his blessing because he doesn't say anything negative about him. He says, Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Now it's likely that both of these two men who were with Paul had now gone out on, on a missionary endeavor to these two locations. Dalmatia, where Titus went to, um, was northeast across the Adri Adriatic Sea. It was northeast from Italy, all right? Um, Galatia, which is where Cretans had gone to, was in the middle of Turkey. So this was across the Aegean Sea from Rome. Now, it just, he just commenting on him. He's like, Demas, he left. He became a lover of the world. But, you know, hey, Timothy, the reason, part of the other reasons I'm calling you here, not only have I been kind of betrayed by someone I, I thought was one thing and they turn out not to be that, but, you know, these other two guys have left too to go continue the work. It was right and good that these two had gone out, but it heightened the apostle's need for his friend Timothy to come and to come soon. And so verse 11, he goes, only Luke is with me. Luke was the opposite of Demas. Luke had been with Demas and Paul during Paul's first imprisonment, as you could read in Philemon. 
Luke was included in the greeting to the Colossians. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, we're not going to read it. But there, as Paul is, is greeting the Colossians, Demas was in that greeting. Luke was included there, and in that particular greeting, Luke was called the dearly beloved physician. But unlike Demas, Luke was a tough friend for tough times. He was with Paul while he was in prison the first time, and he's here with Paul during the last time. He was Paul's biographer. He was Paul's secretary. If you read the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, you see a lot of we passages. We did this. We went here. We went there. And as you're reading Acts, you see those we passages. They indicate that, that Luke was with Paul during some of the most difficult times of his ministry. Acts 27, incidentally, records when Paul was taken to Rome for the last time. This particular trip where Paul is now in prison, um, you see the word we there indicating that Luke was there at his arrest. Luke was there possibly during his transport, and now Luke is here with him while he's in prison. He was also Paul's traveling physician. You know, some of you may know that Paul lamented the fact that he had this thorn in his side, right? And he had prayed, God, take this thorn out of my side. Many commentators think it was some type of eye disease because there's a time where, where in one of the letters, Paul's like, hey, look, look how I'm concluding this letter with such big letters. I'm doing it in my own writing. Like a lot of people think that Paul had very poor eyesight and there was some type of disease he had in his eyes. And that was possibly the thorn in his flesh that Paul had prayed, God, can you take this ailment away from me? So a lot of people think that Luke was his personal physician that helped him with and through those things. Luke gave us the book of Acts, um, and he gave us the most theological of the four Gospels, the Gospel of Luke. Um, and like I said, he was likely Paul's secretary here writing 2 Timothy. Paul dictated his letters, and so there was usually somebody there writing down what Paul was saying, and so we're pretty sure it was Luke doing that. So... Um, but as Paul's dictating this letter, and, and only Luke is there with him, Paul gets very incredibly directive to go back to that statement, Timothy, come now. Come now. Timothy's arrival would form um, really the heart of not just a group of tough friends that Paul needed in a tough time, but a tough team that would then support Paul in his final days here on earth and then continue the work Paul, did, or Paul uh, started and then is leaving behind as he goes. So his next directive to Timothy, verse 11. Come quickly. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. So here's one of those other things that you go, okay, what do we learn from scriptures like this? Bring Mark with you, he is useful to ministry. What we learn from this in scripture is if you know somebody named Mark, bring them with you. No. But if they're not coming to church, it might be a good application. Anyways, but that's not the application we're going to look at. What do we know about this guy Mark? Well, from Acts chapter 12, we learn that Mark was a very advantaged young man. His mother's home was the center of the Jerusalem church. You read in the book of Acts in verse 12 that, that when Peter was arrested and was in jail and the angel showed up and set him free and un, undid the shackles and opened the gate and Peter left, it was Mark's mom's house that Peter went to after that. So Mark was um, involved in, in the lives of the apostles from a very early age. He had known all the apostles since boyhood. And so when Paul went on his first missionary journey, we read in the book of Acts that Mark went with him as a helper. All right? But what we also read is that for some unknown reason that we don't know, Mark decided to bail on the missionary trip. He left Paul in Pamphylia and went home. And you could read about that in Acts chapter 13. Now, Paul considered... Uh, Mark leaving him on this missionary trip earlier in his life as a desertion. So later when Paul was getting ready to go on his next missionary journey, uh, Barnabas was like, hey, let's bring Mark. And Paul's like, nope, I don't want to take him. He's a flake. He bailed on the trip last time. He left us in the middle of the missions trip. And so it tells us in Acts that the disagreement was so heated that Paul and Barnabas actually split. And decided to go do two different, separate missionary trips. Paul uh, took Silas and went on his way. And then Barnabas and Mark went on another. After that, we have no record of what happened with Mark. We have no record. Um, but it appears that after his time with Barnabas, um, as he went on this missionary with Barnabas, and whatever happened through that trip and after, it was a period of healing for Mark. Because we find Mark pop up again with Paul during Paul's first Roman imprisonment in Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. 
We also see in Philemon 24 that I showed you guys earlier that Paul calls Mark, at that point, a fellow worker. And then in 1 Peter 5.13, Peter calls uh, Mark a son. So we know that there was this initial relationship. Mark kind of bailed, failed, deserted, whatever you want to call it. Paul's like, nope, can't count on him. I don't want him as part of the team. Mark ends up going on a missionary trip with Barnabas. Time happens. And then at some point, Paul went, you know what? He's redeemed. He's good. He's useful. Bring Mark with you, for he is useful to me in the ministry. So now, at this time of, of Paul's greatest need, the darkest time of his life, he not only calls for Timothy, his son in the faith, but then he calls for John Mark. And he says that he is useful to me in the ministry. Mark had gone from useless to useful. Mark had gone from failure, deserter, whatever you want to call it, to now someone that Paul said, this is someone who I want to count on. This is someone who I can count on. And there's also this beautiful fact on top of it that this missionary dropout went on to become the author of the gospel of Mark. The great action gospel, right? It's all about the the servanthood of Jesus and how he served and what he did. Mark was the perfect man to write it. Such encouragement, or encouragement comes from Mark's life and what we learn from this. And really in the context of, of your Christianity, but in the, in the narrow context of the study here and your endeavors as a friend and someone that, that your Christian friends can count on and depend on in the tough times, um, your past failures, your past rejections, your past screw-ups, None of that affects your present usability. None of that affects your present ability for God to use you. None of that affects your present ability to be a blessing in the lives of people um, that, are, that, that need to count on you. Just because you screwed up before doesn't have anything to do with what you can do now. You can come back from disgrace. And even more than coming back from disgrace, you, be, you can become incredibly useful to Christ. It doesn't matter. We all screw up. We all fall down. We all let someone down. We all let God down. We all have these issues. And sometimes we get so caught up in those failures that we say, I can't move forward. I can't uh, do that ministry. I can't plug in with those people. I'm going to isolate myself and not have friends because I'm afraid I'm going to let them all down. And, 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 And we isolate ourselves from service, from serving, from people. And that's not how the body of Christ is supposed to function. The body of Christ is people ministering to people. It's us serving one another together as a community. That's the body of Christ. And so in a few months' time, Luke, Mark, and Timothy all gathered together for Paul's departure. A perfectly tough team for a tough time. Verse 13. When you come, Paul says, bring the cloak I left in Troas with Carpus, as well as the scrolls, especially the parchments. The cloak, what's the application? We all have a favorite jacket, right? You ever lost it? It's terrible. That's the application. All right, so um, it's possibly when he got arrested, he left it there. We don't know. But hey, pick pick up my cloak, right? But then he says, as well as the scrolls, and especially the parchments. The parchments are what Paul really wanted. Parchments were animal skin vellum. Um, We don't know exactly what it was, um, but a lot of people think there was likely uh, the scrolls and the parchments were Paul's, uh, a copy of the Old Testament scriptures that he had. Um, that people also think that it's possibly some of Paul's own writings, his own personal notes, his own you know, musings and commentaries on Scripture and who Jesus was. Um, a lot of people speculate that Paul actually had copies of the Lord's words or early narratives of the life of Jesus. Uh, one guy said this, and it's just speculative, but it's interesting. He goes, could they have been early Christian documents, perhaps collections of sayings of Jesus or early versions of Christian preaching, or Old Testament exegesis? Could these have been the materials that Luke and Mark 
used later to put together their gospel accounts. We don't know, but it is not a completely implausible hypothesis, in my view, that they contained early Christian literature, either of Paul's own manuscripts or sayings of Jesus or fragments uh, or primitive accounts of the Lord's life antedating the four gospel writers. Was Paul deliberately interested in a written record of Christ's life? Would this not be consistent with the central theme of the pastorals that we've just been studying to guard the deposit of the gospel? Intriguing possibilities. It's pretty intriguing to me that the guy who wrote most of the New Testament may have had input in at least two of the gospels before they were written. May have said, hey guys, bring my parchments because I, I want, we need to write this stuff down. We need, th- it's all speculation, okay? It's all speculative, but it's an interesting thought. Either way, we do know that there were three important commodities coming to Rome in the next few months. Timothy, Mark, and the scriptures. And each of these involved dangers of one kind or another, and so thus we get the final directive from Paul in verses 14 and 15. Alexander the coppersmith did great harm to me. The Lord will repay him according to his works. Watch out for him yourself because he strongly opposed our words. Now the Greek context of the words there suggests that the harm that Paul's referring to from this guy Alexander was, was Alexander actually outing Paul that ultimately led to his um, final arrest and prosecution and all these things that, that you can read about in the end of Acts. Um, so he's saying, Timothy, Mark, guys, watch out for this guy. He really hates the church. So, um, to conclude this, this message in the study, you know, Paul's very concerned with his tough team of friends getting to him without delay, without harm. And, and you can imagine uh, what a group of encouragers they would be to Paul. We don't know uh, exactly if they made it on time. We, we don't really have record of that. But if they did, we can imagine that, that, that a few things happened. First, as, as Paul's closest friends, his inner circle, his, his dream team, if you will, they strengthened him, right? They encouraged him in this darkest time of his life. The beloved physician Luke, who had been with Paul from the very beginning, a man that was absolutely devoted to Paul, loved Paul, probably knew Paul better than anyone else in the world, and one who Paul loved equally. Timothy, Paul's spiritual son, one that that it's likely Paul had a direct hand in in leading to the Lord and and discipled him and, and raised him up and watched him become a leader in the church and and, and then Mark, the successful failure, with such a spirit within him of, of humility and a desire to serve and a desire to, to, to overcome his mistakes and move forward. You know, such a great encouragement they had to have brought to Paul. But this encouragement was a two-way street because if they were there when Paul was executed, um, Paul would have shown them how to die in the Lord, to die with with boldness and the, and the dignity and the confidence of Christ in who he is. Now, Paul's departure, his final pouring out, um, really went beyond words to strengthening them for the future. And I believe that, that Paul's life and his testimony um, and them possibly being there for it is what strengthened them in their continuing ministry and really laying the, the foundations, building upon the foundations that Paul's built and moving forward to that all the way to the faith that we have today. Second thing, imagine what, what theolog... Theolo- <laughs> theologizing went on as these four heavyweights just poured over these parchments, right? Paul's writings together, they're just going through it and seeking out Christ and all the scriptures, learning and rejoicing together, and then the strategizing. And this is really what I believe was the crux of why Paul wanted to get them there face to face. You know, as I said earlier, Paul was the missionary general of the early church. That These guys were his lieutenant generals. You know, you could just imagine, you know, Paul saying, okay, Luke, after my death, I want you to go here and do this and, 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 and get this ministry taken. And Timothy, you know, here's what I want you to do when you get back to Ephesus. And Mark, you know, stay close to Peter. Perhaps they strategized about writing. You know, like I said, all three of them, all three of them together wrote more than half the entire New Testament. It's interesting to think that they discussed writing down the narratives of Jesus' life and what he said and, and coming up with the Gospels of Luke and Mark that were later written by those two. And if that was a conversation that happened, what advice did Paul give? I mean, it's just all speculative at that point, but it's interesting. Uh, but the point is, is that at the end of Paul's life, he had tough friends that he could count on. He had Christian brothers that would take that four to six month journey at the drop of a hat to come strengthen him 
to come be with him, to come encourage him, and then to come to continue up until the very last moment to learn from him and to get their orders from him as they continue to take the gospel into this world. These types of friends are what we all need, and these types of friends are what we all must be for one another. Dependable, trustworthy, not getting caught up with the cares of the world such that we would care about our own comforts before the hurting of our friends. That we would care more about our own conveniences than the inconveniences of getting involved with those we care about. But that we would truly be people that live as Christ commanded us. That we would deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. Putting each other's needs above our own at all times. Knowing that we're going to be taken care of because God said, hey, Seek first my kingdom, and I'm going to take care of you with all the other stuff. And I think as a church, when we do that, when we get to that place and we see that fruit begin to grow and multiply in our own little microcosm communities that we have, and then as the bigger communities we're a part of, our fellowship, our church, and then outside of that, I think we're going to see the gospel go forth in, in, in ways we may have not have experienced before. We're going to see the revival that people are praying about. We're going to see the true gospel of Jesus Christ affect people's lives in such ways that they will just be drawn to him, to want to repent of their sins and give their lives to him. But it starts with us saying, okay, God, I want to live the way you're calling me to live. I want to be obedient to how you're calling me to be. I want to be obedient to how you're, you're, you're calling me to be with my Christian family and my friends. Because whether we're in the tough times or we're the ones outside of the tough times, when we support one another as Christ is calling us to do, it just creates this wonderful, beautiful thing called the community, the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement and the challenge. Lord, there's so much, God. Even, even sometimes when we read details at the end of a book like this and they just seem to be musings or final thoughts of somebody, God, there's so much in what you've given us, what you pervert, preserved for us in your word. And so, God, I ask that just we would be encouraged tonight. Lord, if we ourselves are, are in a tough situation, a tough circumstance tonight, and we need some tough friends to come surround us and to support us and lift us up. I pray, God, that you would provide those people for those people. I pray, God, that if we're the ones who aren't in the tough time, but we know of someone who is going through a tough time, that, God, we would be willing and ready at a moment's notice to go minister to them, to go strengthen them, to go encourage them. That, God, we wouldn't be so consumed with ourselves and our own comforts and our own pleasures, our own conveniences, that we would neglect the love that you're calling us to express towards one another within the body of Christ. And that, God, I pray as we do that as the body of Christ, the ministry of that, the witness of that, the glory of God that shines in that would, would permeate the world around us, God, and lead the people wanting to know who you are. That they would want to know, why are your people like that? Because it's definitely not how the world is. And so God, we thank you. We love you. Use us. Encourage us, God. And let us be that blessing in each other's lives. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Let's worship.